exist? Did Jesus rise from the dead? This is a question that for the believers, it's already kind of a done deal. But for a lot of people in the world, it's not a done deal. Does, did it happen? Does God exist? And the, the same response from a doubting world is always the same, is prove it, prove it. If everyone could see it, if everyone could have the same evidence, if everyone could see what the disciples saw, what Mary saw, they saw Jesus rise from the dead, they saw his arms, they saw his holes, they saw him eat food in front of them. The theory goes, if everyone could have seen that, then everyone would believe, right? There'd be uniform belief. There wouldn't be any more doubting. It would be a better world. Everyone would believe in God. But I have to ask, if that was true, if that actually happened, would everybody still believe? I doubt it. Because thousands of people saw Jesus alive. They saw him do miracles. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him cast out demons. They saw him heal blind people, turn water into wine, multiply food to feed 5,000 people. I mean, you can go on and on. Thousands of people tangibly interacted with this man and the miracles he did, and they still didn't believe. Even after in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is resurrected, it, Matthew records that some of them still doubted. So I don't think widespread evidence is what will convince the world, not in the sense that we would think of it. Because maybe God's answer to helping people believe and have faith is doubt. Now stick with me here. That God can, in a sense, leverage doubt to draw us to himself. He can, Because doubt forces you to ask the questions, is it worth it and is it true? Doubt makes you ask those questions honestly. Is this worth it? Is it worth my time and my energy and my resources, who I am as a person? And is it true? Did it happen? And if, if the answer to those questions is yes, then our lives are transformed. It's, it's, a, it's a watershed moment because doubt makes you ask those questions. Could God use doubts in people's lives to draw us to himself? In the Bible, God asks many people questions in the midst of their doubt. Over and over again, you see God interacting with people in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the same God. God doesn't change. And you see the same sort of questioning come up. Jesus does it too, over and over again. In fact, God is drawing us, he's drawing these people to himself, but he's not making up their minds for them. They have free will, they can choose what they want to do with it. But he still asks the question, various questions. Things like, in the middle of their doubt, the first question God ever asked people is in Genesis chapter three, actually. It's the first question recorded, God asking a question. And the question is, where are you? To Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He asked that question. Now, before the fall, God didn't have to ask that question. But Adam and Eve at this point have eaten of the tree of knowledge. They know good from evil. They know faith from doubt. They know closeness with God to not closeness with God. They know shame now. They know guilt now. And what do they do? They cover themselves. They hide. And God says, where are you? Now, God, it's not physical hide and seek. God knows where they are. But he's saying, your hearts are far from me. And maybe God is asking them, where are you? Not because he doesn't know where they are, but because he wants them to know where he is. Where are you? Where are you? To a desperately hopeless Moses in Exodus chapter 14, Moses is overwhelmed by the people of Israel. Their demands, they're lost in the desert. He's on his face before God, crying out, to God. And God asked Moses a question, why are you crying out to me? And then he goes on to tell him, go do this and this. Why are you just wasting your time crying out to me? But he doesn't tell Moses what to do. He asks him a question in his doubt, in his crisis, really. To a scared Elijah in 1 Kings 19, who is hiding in a cave from his enemies, he's running. He, he's doubting that God's going to do what he said he was going to do. And what does God say to Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? In his doubt, he's drawing near to him. To a doubtful Ezekiel, who's looking out on a vision of a field of dry bones, he asks Ezekiel, can these bones live, son of man? And to a sorrowful and questioning Mary at the empty tomb, she's doubting. She, she can't find the body of the, the man that she follows and loves. Where is his body? I need to help Jesus. He's gone. Jesus asks her, woman, why are you crying? Why 
Why are you crying? See, in their doubts, God gave them a question and then God lets them answer it. God doesn't provide ultimate, complete, total evidence in the sense that we would think of it for carte blanche belief, but he does offer choice. He does offer free will. And implicit in choice is doubt, but also implicit in choice and free will is faith and hope and love and joy and the ability to know those things. But without doubt, can you even have faith? I think they're both are going to be present in this world as long as we are alive on planet Earth. You will have faith and you will have doubt. And you can also have knowledge, which I'll get to in a moment. But doubt is an integral part of faith. Some of the strongest Christians I've ever met are people that truly, truly doubt. I mean, look at someone like C.S. Lewis, who was a professed atheist, and he came around to be one of the greatest Christian thinkers in history by the influence of J.R.R. Tolkien, who helped convince him otherwise. So some of the strongest doubters can be some of the strongest people of faith and Christ followers you've ever met. But without the journey, without the struggle, without the, the back and forth and the questions and the wondering, is this worth it and is this true? Without the honest inquiry, is there a reward at the end? But God says repeatedly in the Bible, if we seek him, we will find him. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen, God promises us, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And if we do that, we'll realize all along that when we thought our hearts were far from God, our shame and our guilt was cutting us off from God, God, in fact, was pursuing you even further in your doubts. But doubts abound today, maybe more than ever in our culture, and especially in our country. Just recently, the Gallup company uh, revealed, released a poll every year about church attendance, and for the first time in U.S. history, less than the majority of adults attend a church, synagogue, or a temple in a week. 47% of adults said they go to church. We might think, oh, that sounds pretty good. But it's down 20 points from where it was 20 years ago. And I think think I'm I'm a millennial. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm Gen X. I'm running that line. But um, uh, 31% of millennials... uh, say uh, they have no religious affiliation. Like, at least they're being honest. I, I respect that. Instead of just checking Christian. 33% of Gen Z said they have no religious affiliation. Doubt abounds in our culture. They have asked, is this worth it? And is it true? And if they've even asked. And if they have asked, they've said, no, it's not worth it. It's not true. But for people to say there's no God, like the clip showed in the movie Contact, If you're going to say there's no God, that would surmise that you possess all available knowledge, that you have the ability to know all things that can be known, and so therefore there is no God. You can't can't say that because no one has all knowledge. No one knows everything. So there's really no such thing as a true atheist. There is a skeptical agnostic. That is a true thing, and I respect that, the honesty of that. But for one, there's no such thing as an actual atheist because you don't know. And to have the same, uh, to share the same criteria on the believer, God is neither provable nor disprovable because I don't have all knowledge either. I have a lot of experience. I've seen a whole lot and I fully, fully know that God is real. But you can't prove it philosophically necessarily. But there's no such thing as an atheist. I mean, think about it this way. I think we can all agree in the room that the Easter Bunny I don't want to poo-poo on anybody's parade. Easter Bunny's not real, okay? Everybody fine with that? Easter Bunny's not real. But if I was going to come at you and try to convince you constantly that the Easter Bunny uh, was not real, you would eventually go, you know what, maybe there is something to this Easter Bunny thing. Because this guy can't seem to let it go. It's almost like my obsession with a fictional being is proving that maybe the fictional being isn't fictional. It's like, if God's not real, then why do you care? Why do you care? Because maybe deep down we know that God is real. To be fair then, as I said, the same standard, I can't prove that God exists, but there are really, really good arguments. And I know we have a lot of well-educated, lifelong believers in the room, but we might have a few seekers, a few skeptics. That's, I, I welcome that, and that's great. There are some really good arguments for the existence of God, actually. And if you've never, if you've never heard these before, I hope they equip you in your faith. But here's just a few. I'll run through them really quickly. The first one's called the cosmological argument, 
which claims that all things in nature are dependent on something else for their existence. So if you look in this room, everything in this room is contingent on somebody putting it here, somebody building it, somebody making it. Someone designed it and set it into order, set it into place. And that's how it is with the cosmos. This found its origin with Plato and Aristotle. I know you can quote Plato and Aristotle in a sermon. It makes you sound really smart, but I don't read Plato and Aristotle very frequently. But they started this idea, but they believe the cosmos was eternal. We found out that is not true anymore. It really got its legs with Thomas Aquinas when he said that the universe owes everything to his existence to an uncaused cause. And we would call that cause to be God. So that's the cosmological. The teleological argument is that there is evidence of order and therefore design in nature. So because there is order and intricacy in the design of of nature and all that we see, therefore it implies there is a designer. The human eye, for example, is far too advanced to be happened by chance. Mathematicians have come up with it that the odds of life forming on planet Earth are so astronomically high by chance that it would be the equivalent of a tornado going through a junkyard and making a 747 jet. That's sort of a cliche at this point, but that's the odds of it happening by chance. Then there's the moral law argument, that everybody has a moral law within themselves. Outside of cultures, we share same values about you know, certain things like murder or abuse of some kind. We would all agree with that. So because there's a moral law within every human heart, it implies there's a moral law giver. And the fact that people break the moral law implies that a law actually exists, and we're not very good at keeping it sometimes. So, as we talk about all this and the existence of God, sometimes people think about faith, doubt, faith. We think about faith as something either you have or you don't have. It's like a switch you turn off or on. But really, faith is like a process. It's a process of your whole life. It's a thing in which you either grow and diminish or you progress and regress with each passing day. It has ups and downs, victories and setbacks, triumphs. But Christianity is not just faith in faith alone. We don't just say, I have faith in faith. Our faith is only as good as the object of that faith. And so our faith, of course, is in Jesus Christ. Now, when I think about this idea of faith and doubt, choice, free will, I think about choose-your-own-adventure books from the 1980s, okay? Now, in school back then, they would do a thing called book fairs. Can you show the picture of the book fair? Um, Scholastic, of course, comes in with their big carts and they roll them in and the book fair's coming, y'all. Your mom gives you a few dollars in your hand. Like, I can smell this picture right now. I remember that. This, the, the paper and the, the excitement, you know, buy some Mad Libs and some ghost story books or whatever. And I like to buy the choose your own adventure books because you could choose which way the story would go. You were not at the whim of an author. You could decide. When you get to a certain page, turn to the page number uh, picture. When you get to a certain page, yeah, you are a shark. That, yeah, that's plausible. You could be a shark. I don't know. And then you get to a certain page number, and you could, you could, you could say, well, to go this way, I'm going to do this. To go this way, you can do this. Or if you don't know what you want to do, turn to this page. And now, we would always kind of cheat and go to the back of the story and then read it backwards so that you wouldn't die some horrific death uh, so that you kind of knew it was coming. But regardless, you had, there you go, if you want to hitch a ride on the whale, you know, turn to page 85, okay? So when you hear this account I'm getting ready to read in Luke chapter 24 of Jesus' resurrection and the proof he offers, the evidence really he offers, you have to ask, we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to accept the testimony of people that lived 2,000 years ago? And do I have faith that they were telling the truth? Do I believe them? And when I turn the page and read this account, do I trust them and what they are telling me? If the answer is no, well, you just turn your page and the story's over, the book fair's over, and you can go back to class. If your answer is yes, then keep reading. God doesn't even care if you go to the end of the story and read it backwards. He just wants you to know how it ends. And he wants you to be a part of that story. Because if these people are telling the truth, if Luke is telling the truth, it's the most important evidence for God of all time that he, Jesus, is alive. Repeatedly, Jesus would show himself bodily to people around him. You don't don't need to completely doubt any longer, but see and believe. 
So look at these verses, Luke 24, starting in verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do you... And, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. See, Jesus, sometimes he's astounded by people's faith. In the New Testament, many times he's astounded by the belief level of certain people. Here he's almost astounded by their doubt. Like, what? why? Whoa. Why are you doubting? Here I am. He said, touch me and see. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving, still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me must be, uh, and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Jesus is showing authority really with what's been written by the way. He's not discrediting, he's not deconstructing it. He's showing that what God has written is authoritative and true and it must come to pass from the Old Testament. And that is important to note. Now, I'm going to ask for a volunteer. I'm not going to pull a magic trick. I'm not going to do something weird. Let's ask for, does anyone want to volunteer? You might get a prize at the end. Anybody? Nobody wants to volunteer? I don't like to volunteer either with things like this. Anybody want to? All right, Gary. Thanks, man. Come on up, Gary. Stairs are over here. Yeah. All right, Gary. I'm going to ask you a question. I have a $5 bill in my hand. Let me stand on the light so I look better. Okay. I have a $5 bill in my hand, and I'm about to destroy your faith in a good way. Do you believe I have a $5 bill in my hand? Well, I believe it's possible. You believe it's possible. Okay. The reason I'm saying I could be destroying your faith is because now you know that I do indeed have a $5 bill in my hand right? You see the money, you don't need faith anymore. Faith is required when you have doubts, but we don't know when you don't know for sure, but when you have knowledge, faith is no more. Now you know, right? You don't say, well, I don't know if you had $5, but now you know. So to reward you, I'm giving you a pop socket. Here you go. Put it on your phone. Thanks, man. Thanks, Gary. It's a real difference between Faith and knowledge. Faith's important, but uh, you like, I'm going to boast in the Lord here, not in myself, but it comes a point in your life where you've seen God do so many things. It's not just faith anymore. Like, I know. Like that song by um, Yolanda Adams, I Know My Redeemer Lives. She, she said, I spoke to him this morning, okay? <laughs> I know he lives. Um, there's, there's a difference between just mere faith, this nebulous idea of faith, that process of faith is an important process, but it's also something of saying about knowledge. See, sometimes people think, in order to be a Christian, I can't have doubts. And I always say to those people, come and join the club, because you're in good company. We'll have faith, we'll have doubts, we'll also have knowledge of going, and at this point, I know that Jesus is real. I know that he did this for me. I heard him speak to me. I've seen him do miracles. I've seen supernatural things in my life. I know that he's real. The further we walk with God, God doesn't have to ask us, where are you anymore, right? You want to be found. The closer we get with God, the more we walk with God. At the closing of the movie Contact, there's a really powerful scene in that movie where Jodie Foster's character is turning a radio dial and she's saying into the radio, she's speaking out into the universe and she's saying, is anybody out there? Is anybody there? She even cries out to her dad. Dad, are you there? It's a powerful scene. And that really is the cry of many people's lives. To a world where skepticism is a new religion, 
where disbelief is more popular than unbelief, where really anything of authority is held at arm's length except personal opinion. That's been very important lately. But everything else is held with skepticism except what I say. In that world where any religious structure is seen as oppressive and suspect, right? The cry of the human heart is the same. Is anybody out there? Does anybody care? Is anyone there? Can anything be trusted any, anymore? I mean, our culture is so upside down right now. You almost, in order to find the truth, you have to look at the thing that's being ignored and suppressed to find out what is actually true. And that's been the case with Christianity for 2,000 years. We've constantly been oppressed, constantly been smeared. The Bible, Jesus, Christianity, you can go on. It's constantly being put down because deep down, I think people know it is the truth. People know it is the answer. Is anybody out there? Does anybody care? Look at Jesus' answer again in Luke 24. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Again, he's asking a question of them, isn't he? He's asking them a question and their doubt. He's leveraging that doubt to draw him to himself. Why are you frightened? Why are you doubtful? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? See and believe. See and know that I'm here. The difference of that, what that means for our lives, the foundation of what Jesus is saying, like, like I am the rock. If you build my, your life on me, the storms will come but you will not be washed away. And the desire of God is for all people to believe in this only son of God and to know that he lives because God loves us and that is the truth. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you that you draw near to us all the time and particularly in our doubts. When things don't make sense, we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you, God, that you're patient with us you love us through and through. And I pray over anybody here and now that maybe is in a place of heavy doubt, a place of heavy um, confusion. And Lord, your answer to them and to us is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. Here I am. Touch me and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And know that the, there's peace when we do that. God, just as the flowers are drawn to the sun and all of creation sings your praises. You give us a choice. You give us free will and volition. You cry out, where are you? Then we can decide how we want to answer that. Thank you, God, that you draw near to us. You don't give up on us. You seek us out when we're hiding in our shame and our guilt. You don't let us go. God, you're worthy of all praise. We join with the host of heaven as we sing your praises now.